but I determined this within myself, that I will not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I wrote this very thing to you. Rest when I come, I should have sorrow over those whom I ought to uh, have joy, having confidence in you that my joy is the joy of you. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you some extent, not to be so severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, rest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for this is this ad I lot that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ. Rest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Yes, let's go up to that point. So as we come today, let us come with a joyful heart. Let us come to learn of the Lord. Let his spirit teach us. Let his love work in our hearts. God has poured his spirit upon us. And therefore, each and every one of us has capacity to love. Because God has poured his spirit out upon our hearts. So therefore, this morning, as we come, let us love one another. Let the love of God work in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and we honor your name this morning. We give you praises because of this opportunity that you have given us, O oh God. We love you and we honor you, O oh God. We come to fellowship with one another. We come to commune with you, O oh God. We come to fellowship with you. We come to commune with you this morning. And Lord, as we come into your presence, we surrender our hearts. We release ourselves, O oh God. We cast down our worries. We cast down our anxieties, O oh God, that we may be partakers of your love that is present here with us, O oh God. We love you, Lord. We bless you and we exalt you this wonderful morning. We glorify your name, Jehovah. We glorify you because you alone are worthy. You alone are holy. You alone are righteous, O oh God. We love you. We honor you. We pray that every person that fellowship with us this morning, Every person that gather in this place, oh God, we are gathering in your house. We are gathering in your, uh, in your house. We are gathering in your presence. We are gathering around your table, oh God. I pray that every person that fellowship here this morning, they are going to feel your love. They are going to experience your divine love and comfort in their life. They are going to experience an encounter with your presence, oh God. Thank you, everlasting Father. We thank you and we honor you. We bless your name, oh God. We surrender ourselves. We surrender our minds. We focus on you, O oh God. We leave anything else that may distract us. And we set our heart. We set our mind. We gaze upon your word. We gaze upon you this morning, O oh God. As we pray that we be blessed. Lord, as we fellowship, we be blessed. As we commune with you and commune with one another. We thank you and we bless you. This we pray in Jesus' name.
Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. Our God is faithful. How many know that our God is faithful? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, let's be happy in the house of the Lord. Give him a dance. Give him a dance. One more time, give him a dance. Hey.
That indeed is our prayer this morning. Father, we pray that you fill us. That's our heart desire this morning. It's only you, Lord, that can take the longing in our hearts. It's only you, Lord, that can take, can quench the thirst in our souls. Fill us this morning, oh God. Come and fill us. Fill us with yourself, Lord, this morning. Come and satisfy the hunger in our hearts, the thirst in our spirit. Lord, we thirst for you. We thirst for you this morning. Our hearts yearn for you. Oh God, our heart thirsts for you. As a deer pants for the brooks of water, so is the longing of our spirit that we may be filled of you, Lord, that you may come and fill us with yourself this morning. We desire you more than anything else, Lord. We desire you more than anything else in our life. Come and fill us, oh God. Release your Holy Spirit to fill the void in our hearts. Fill the void in our lives. Lord, bring the meaning, bring that beauty, Lord, in our hearts, the beauty in our lives. Oh God, we love you. We bless you this morning. We bless your name. We exalt you, oh God. We submit to you this day. We submit to your word. We submit to the Holy Spirit that this morning you come and feed us. Come and feed us. Come and feed us, O oh Lord. Come and feed us. Come and feed our lives this day. Come and feed our hearts, O oh God. We long for you. We long for you, O oh God. We long for you. You mean everything to us. You mean our very life. Lord, you're the source of our sustenance. You're the source of our life. Lord Almighty, we thank you. We bless you today. We exalt your name. We exalt your everlasting Father. We confess the Lord. We need you every step of our way. We need you, oh God. We dare not move forward without your presence. We dare not move forward, Lord, without you, without your company, oh God. And this morning we come to seek you. We come to seek you, our Father. We come to seek you, our Father. You are our house, oh God. You are our house. We long for you. We need you, oh God. You're the reason that we came, that we may fellowship with you. We may have communion with you, oh God. And at your presence, at your feet, that we may be satisfied. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you this morning. We give you praises. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, as we prepare for to share the Holy Communion, we may have our seat. I would like to read a scripture from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, from verse 1 all the way to verse 11. I, Simon Peter, a body servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which you have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through this we may be, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through rust. But also for this reason, very reason, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and about, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has, has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even dirig more diligent, no more your call, to make your call an election sure, 
for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you, abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We blessed the Lord this morning. In the book of Genesis, when God created man, he placed him in the Garden of Eden. And in that particular place, there was the system that Adam needed to operate and be able to fulfill the mandate that God had given him. And so is everything that God created. Everything that has been created. Take, for example, the fish. It's in the water that its system has been built in. The system that sustains it. It's, uh, it's nutrition. It's everything that it needs to sustain its life. It's found in its environment. And God was reminding us that this morning, he has created us as his sons. And he has placed us in his kingdom. And his word tells us that everything that we need, not for just, just this life, but also to lead a godly life that he has already provided. And it is possible to walk through this life intimidated and resourced and not knowing what God has availed for us. And therefore, he is reminding us this morning that everything that we need as sons of God to operate and to fulfill our divine mandate here on earth, God has already created it. He has established that system that we need. And how do we access these resources? He is telling us that through his divine power, through our knowledge, through Jesus Christ, as we walk in our journey to know God, as we walk in our journey to go deeper and deeper with God, he revealed to us himself. He revealed his nature to us. And as our lives are filled with his knowledge, we are able to access that divine power. And through that divine power, we receive our provision that we need to operate as sons of God here on earth. And this morning, even as we share and we break the blood, I want us to reflect on this. The things that God has made available for us as his sons. God has given us a mandate and a purpose that we need to fulfill in our life here on earth. And it's only through our knowledge in him that we're able to access what God has made available for us. He says all things. Mention them. Anything that you need to operate successfully and fulfill God's mandate here on earth, God has revealed to it, has, uh, has provided it for us. But we need to access them. We need to know that which God has availed to us. And we know that through our walk with God, as we walk with him, he make it known to us. What is there for me as a son of God to operate and to fulfill my mandate? And therefore this morning, even as ushers guide us to take an to come to the front and take the elements. Let us reflect upon that word. That anything that you ever needed as a son of God, God has made it available for us. There is no need to be intimidated. There is no need to feel defeated in our life. Because God, our Father, has made provision for everything that we need. May therefore our journey and our walk with the Lord bring those things to our knowledge, that which God has made available for me and for you to fulfill our purpose here. So that when we walk through our life, as we do our day-to-day -day activities, as we carry on everything that God has mandated us to do, we will do so with full knowledge that we are sons of God and he has made available for us what we need to be successful and to fulfill our mandate. Amen. I hope everyone has been served. Let's pray uh, so that we can share. Our Father, this morning, we thank you for you have prepared a table for us. Thank you for this wonderful fellowship that you have brought each and every one of us. Lord, that we may have an encounter with you. Lord, we thank you and we honor you. As we break bread and take the cup, we do acknowledge that 
your house, this family, is one of the resources that you have given us to us. You have given to us as your sons. And we appreciate one another. We appreciate one another, oh God. That each and every one of us is unique in their own way. We are different, for we have different mandates, different strengths and weaknesses, different giftings and graces the Lord you have given us. We acknowledge that and we appreciate the diversity that you have created in our midst. That we may be able to live together in oneness, graciously fulfilling our unique mandates in serving one another as we serve you, O oh God. We bless you and we honor you. We take this bread and this cup with thanksgiving. We thank you and we honor you. We remember what you have made available to us as your sons. We remember what you have made available to us to operate as resources, to help us, to grace us, to be able to fulfill our purpose and our mandate here on earth. We thank you and we honor you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We may partake now. Uh, children, let's be on our feet. And I request my wife to come and bless the children. Good morning, church. Yes, let's bless our children as they go to their Sunday school. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for blessing us with the fruit of our womb. We thank you for the children that you've given us in this house. And we pray for them as they go to their classes, as they go to be taught. Lord, we pray for understanding. We pray that uh, their young spirits will be open. They will understand as they are being taught. Thank you for each and every one of them even for their young lives. Lord, we bless them. We pray for their teachers. We pray for more wisdom and knowledge and understanding and that life will flow through them as they teach them. We thank you, Lord. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, children, let's uh, go to our classes so that we can be taught. Thank you. Yes, we can walk quietly to our classes. As the rest of us prepare to give, it's time to give. So I kindly request the ushers to wait on us. Those who are distributing, they can just pick an envelope from the usher. Let's package our offering. Giving is a moment of worship. Hope all of us have been served. Package our offering. Let us give thanks for the offering. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to worship you with our substances. Lord, it's always a privilege. It's a reminder, Lord, of what you have done in our lives. Lord, you have sustained us. And as we offer our offerings, as we offer our monies, Lord, we acknowledge that, Lord, you are our source. You are our source. You have given us the strength to work. You have given us the opportunities, Lord, to be of service to mankind. And, Lord, we appreciate you. We are so grateful. We bring our offerings, we bring our tithes and fast fruits with thanksgiving in our heart. Because, Lord, we love you. Is a symbol that, Lord, we love you. And you mean everything to us. You are the source of our life. You sustain us by your grace. You sustain us by your heart, O oh Lord. We thank you and we honor you. We thank you, Lord Almighty. Thank you for the things that you are doing 
among us. The testimonies, Lord, if you are to give, the time will not allow. But Lord, we thank you because you have indeed blessed each and every one of us. Lord, we are so grateful and we come here to say thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your mercies, for your preservation, for your protection upon our lives, upon our loved ones, upon our families, oh God. We thank you and we honor you. This we pray in Jesus' name. So we can just move and drop our envelopes, our offerings to the nearest basket. There are some in the front, some in the middle rows. Go to the nearest. I hope all of us have given. Has come another time to hear the word of God this morning. I know God has prepared something special for us. So let us be attentive as I welcome our senior pastor, Pastor James, to come and take us through from here. Welcome, sir. Well, good morning, everyone. And praise the Lord. Have you greeted all your neighbors? I think you have five neighbors. Some of you greeted just one. And you assume you have greeted all. You have one on the left. You have one on the right. You have one besides you. You, are one, you have one behind you. I don't know how you greet people sitting down. That is very strange, especially here in Africa. Where for us, greetings is a session in the conference. <laughs> greetings alone is a session in the conference. And so... I'll allow you a minute or two to just walk around and greet the brothers and the sisters. If you can hug the huggables, you can shake the shakables and, uh, and feel free, amen. Feel free to just love on the brethren. This is the body of Christ, amen. You have to learn to love the body. You have to learn to celebrate the body, amen. Oh yeah, let there be some noise in the house. Even our visitors, don't you feel... Uh, out of place, please allow the brethren to shake your hand. Amen and amen. All right, keep greeting, keep hugging. We haven't done this for a long time. And you know, some of us have not been home for a long time. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Hallelujah. 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 What a blessing, what a blessing, what a blessing to see the family back together. Amen. We are having days of heaven on the earth. Amen. Having days of heaven on the earth. We still have a minute, James, for you to greet the remaining uh, friends. Feel free. Oh, is your wife? You are greeting your wife. Oh, my God, my God. Leah, have you greeted your neighbors? Wonderful. Some of our children are reporting to high school this week. We'd like to stretch our hands over them and bless them. I know maybe some are not here, but at least uh, I have a deal with blessing. We talked on Sunday and I told her to make sure she's here. So all our children who are reporting to high school, please come to the front. The church would like to pray for you and bless you. Amen and amen. You keep clapping until they get to the front. Amen. Keep clapping, keep clapping, keep clapping for them. Come on, these are our kids. With a shout of thank you, Jesus, for giving our kids victory. Hey! Hey, praise God. Maybe some are not, some are not here. I think so. But we are so grateful. The other time they stood in front of us, there were a bit more than this number. We were thanking God for their very good uh, success and grades. And they all got very good schools. When I say very, I mean what I'm talking about. I said what? They got what they got, what kind of schools? Very. Some of the places we have never stepped, we can at least now step going to do visiting. Have you heard of visiting? The likes of the Kenya High. They are here. Kenya High. I think I heard about Alliance Girls. Is that the same as the Bush? So they are the Bushlets or the Bushites. So one of, some of them are going to be Bu Busherians. Busherians and 
What about Kenya High? What do you call them? Boma. Boma. And uh, I forget the others. I forget the others. But they're going to wonderful, wonderful jobs. Chops. Chops. Forget about it. <laughs> you know, in our days, Meru Technical was simply Meru Technical. In our days, Kaga Girls was Kaga Girls. But I hear nowadays, everything has been nicknamed, including the schools. And uh, so we thank God and... Uh, we were sending them to that uh, new experience of life with love and grace and greetings to the school, to the CU, to everyone. Our kids must excel. You know, one of the things that delights my heart is that we, they were all born in the house here. You know, one of them is my son by, by not, I don't know what to say. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. But one of them here was very sick when he was just a few days old. And we went in and prayed for him. And to see, uh, to see Jabali here looking strong like Jiwela Jabali is a great blessing this morning. So church, would you please stretch your hands towards them? Uh, especially the parents and the cousins and the friends and the neighbors and those that come from the same zone. And mentioning them by name one by one, please go ahead and bless them. As many as you do know by name, please, uh, it's good to mention their names as you uh, pray over their lives. Father, we thank you for this precious seed. It's the seed of faith. This is the seed of God. This is the righteous seed. This is the victorious seed. This is the indomitable seed. This is the seed that cannot be conquered by this world. This is the seed which walks by faith and lives by faith and worships God by faith. This is the seed that is separated unto God. For every good work for which they were born and brought into this world. Father, we thank you that they are, they are our sons and they are our daughters. And you put them in our hands as parents for an eternal purpose. And for that purpose now, oh God, here we are blessing them. Father, as we send them to school, praying that it shall be well with each of them. And Father, you shall provide all that is needed for their up, upkeep in school. For their welfare and their well-being in school. So, Father, glorify yourself using them in school and at home for the glory and praise of your holy name. So we send them to those various schools in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we declare that the schools will say, Blessed is he, blessed is she who comes in the name of the Lord. For they come in the name of the Lord. They come representing the kingdom of God. We, Father, we thank you, Father, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and thank God. Thank God. And so we, we will be seeing you guys shortly. I'm told there will be a holiday in the month of July. And you'll have many stories from the schools. And so we want to escort them to their seat with another hand clap. As we appreciate them. Thank you. Second Sunday in a row. Second Sunday in a row. Dr. Lucy is not with us. Uh, she is ministering in our church in Kiambu one more time. And uh, it was not pre-planned. It just happened to be so, and we bless her. Uh, Margaret Minor also and her husband James are also ministering in a, some church somewhere. I forget the place. I think it's Karatina, if I'm not wrong. We also send our love and greetings to them. And if you brought any apologies from any members of the church, you can register the apologies with Pastor Isaac Monoria after the service. You know, I realized last Sunday, I did so many of the peripheral things until I had no time for preaching. So today I have to stop making announcements. I'm not an announcer. <laughs> I'm not an announcer. The announcer is here. You know, my assignment is to bring to us the word of the living God. The deep things of God. I think today is part three. And I'm moving very slowly as we go through the series of teaching that was deposited in my heart on... 14th of April, as Pastor Randolph was teaching us during ASOM East Africa 2022. He just mentioned in one or two sessions, and I felt that that was our word as a church, and that we need to build a little bit more around that theme of the deep things of God. Now, I don't want to recap everything we shared. I feel I need to move on. If I have to recap, it's just one or two things. The first thing is that the hope of our calling is the revealing of Christ from within us. 
The hope of our calling is not to go to heaven. In our previous studies, you have discovered that heaven is accessible now. In fact, you should be operating from there now. So heaven is not news to us. Heaven is not a destination for us. Heaven is an operation base. The Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. So we are already citizens, and if you be a citizen of Kenya, you don't look forward to the day you will go to Kenya or the day you will visit Kenya because you, if you be a citizen, it means that your home country. But I hope the hope of our calling, put it up on the screen, Colossians 1 and verse 27. The hope of our calling, the thing that every believer should look forward to and lives in the hope until you see this manifested. And no one hopes for what they have. No one hopes for what they have experienced. We only hope for what we know we should have or we should experience, but we have not as yet experienced the same. The whole purpose of Paul's ministry in all the regions where he ministered is captured in this one verse. That God willed to send him to certain people to make known to them what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. I'm still in Colossians 1 verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. As long as you are born again, Christ is in you. As long as you are born again, because Christ is the seed of God sown into us. He's the seed of God. But now, the Christ in you is the hope for the glory you should experience in this life. When and as you mature in him, and when he is revealed, from within you. So the Christ within must be made visible. So the craving and the desire of each of us should be. This Christ who is in me. In the face of all the challenges I face in this world. He needs to manifest. And so that he is my life. And that the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in him. That it is not myself who lives anymore. But Christ lives in me, Galatians 2 verse 20, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in him. And so the hope of our calling, the great thing we are looking forward to, is to see Christ revealed from within. You know, he was initially revealed to us when he was sent by the Father into the earth. And Christ was an external reality. He was sitting there while we were standing here. And we are beholding him as a separate entity. And when we looked at him, according to John 1 verse 14, when we looked at him, Christ, as an external reality, we saw a man, very unique man, he had a different nature and kind of glory. He had the glory that only sons of God can have. We admired him. For he was full of grace. He was full of truth. So we, when we saw him, when he was revealed to us, by that God enticed us, or at least created desire or generated desire within men, the likes of Peter and others, who were the first-hand witnesses, to begin to follow him. I will tell you this. No one was forced to follow Jesus. No one was forced to love Jesus. No one was ever forced to even leave their career, their fish, and everything else and follow him. Whenever you saw him. When Mary the Magdalene saw him. When the short tax collector. Uh, when Zacchaeus saw him. And you know, Jesus did not come for a conference in the house of Zacchaeus. He came, he was actually passing by. They ended up in the house for a meal. But when Zacchaeus saw him, when Matthew, the accountant, saw him, there was something about him that drew you to him. 
Christ revealed to us. He would later on become Christ revealed in us. The best example is the same Peter. You know, in Luke chapter 5, Christ was revealed to him. When he had labored for a whole night, caught no fish. And at the command of Jesus, he got fish. Christ was revealed to him. Something in Peter made him want to follow that man. He left the catch of fish and followed him. Later on in Matthew 16, Christ is revealed not to, but in. Christ is revealed not to, but in. When he asked them the question in Matthew 16 from verse 13, who do they say that I am? And they gave all sorts of answers. Then in verse 15, he turned to them and said, that is in Greek to say, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it is Simon by Jonah who said, teacher, teacher, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Very definitive article there or there. He said, you are the Christ. They are not two. The son, they are not two. Of the living God, they are not two. And Jesus commanded him in verse 17 and said, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. So at that instance, Christ is not only revealed to Peter, you see Christ being revealed in Peter. He has an, the revelation of Christ is an internal reality. So he's not trying to describe his height and his dental formula. Mm, he's gone past that. The father has revealed him in. The next thing after Jesus ascended, Christ was going to be revealed not to and in, but through Peter and company. As they took up what we call the Great Commission. That journey, being revealed, Christ being revealed to you, we are in this service so that you, He can be revealed in you, and so that when we leave this place, we go to work tomorrow, take our children to school, go to the fuel station, go buying some gas or whatever, whatever you go, go to your farm, go buy shambas, whatever. That when you go out there, Christ can be revealed through you. That should be the hope of our calling. It is centered around this one who is the mystery or the secret. The summation of all the deep things that are locked up in the heart of God. And that revelation... Or the self-disclosure of God is referred to throughout the Bible as light. Light. And the absence of that revelation of Christ being revealed to us, in us, through us, leaves man in a place of darkness. Darkness is not necessarily evil, and darkness is not necessarily the absence of light. But darkness is of necessity, the absence of the revelation of God or the self-disclosure of God, the knowledge of God given by God. So when God begins to reveal to us the deep things that are locked up in him, the first thing he gives is light. Everyone say light. Everyone say light. And that light comes by his word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my so that we can be able to maneuver, we can be able to have our movements and our goings in this vast Wild called the deep things that are locked up in God. You see, nothing else gets created until revelation or the light of God is released. And so the Christian journey has no adventure if there be no constant, continuous revelation of Christ. The last time you had a revelation of him, your eyes were open and you saw light. It's perhaps the last time we were excited about even coming for a service. If there be no revelation moving you, sometimes, sometimes darkness will engulf you and overwhelm you. 
and you discover there's a sadness and sorrow in your inner man. So therefore, light is the father manifesting the deep that is locked up in him. Light is when the father chooses to reveal the deep that is locked up in him. And of course, the absence of that revelation or self-disclosure of God is called darkness. And you know, when the light shines, it dispels darkness. And darkness cannot withstand it or comprehend it or understand it. Or darkness has nothing to do with it. So this is what happens. When light shines, there's no negotiation or discussion or treaty or MOU between light and darkness. Once light shows up, darkness knows what to do without being commanded in the name of Jesus. Once the light of God shines, Mr. Louis Vuitton, I'm seeing you over there, looking very good over there. Once light shines, darkness knows what to do. Darkness cannot withstand it. Darkness cannot remain or stay in a place where there be light. Is that okay? That is what happens in our houses when we have a power blackout and it's dark all over. Some of us even put on some candlelight or some whatever other light. And once the, powers, the power is back, we normally say the lights. Once the lights are back, I don't know which is which. Once the lights are back, once the power is back, all of a sudden, when light comes in, all the darkness goes away. And that is to tell you, light is not, darkness is actually not substance. Darkness is not, there's nothing material, there's nothing, there are no elements, atoms that create something called darkness. There is no matter to darkness. Darkness simply is witness or evidence that light is absent in that place. I remember once when we were in primary school, they were just teaching us science. And they were teaching us about light. And there was something they called photosynthesis. Uh, it's the process through which plants manufacture their heart. And we planted some seeds next to the window. There were maize seeds. I still remember one bee. Seeds next to the window. And the teacher prophesied that as soon as they germinate, they'll begin to, to bend towards the window. Hey, the teacher is such a prophet. The truth is, after planting those seeds, within days they began to bend towards the window. And the teacher told us, I told you, they are being attracted towards where there is light. That was the first day. The next day, he, he, she, it was a she, Mwadimuanini. She said, I need you to collect each of you, please, when it is very dark at your home tomorrow morning, and before you come to school, get a bottle and you and then you bring it tomorrow morning for our next ex experiment and you know what we all failed because you, you of course you got the darkness in a bottle then you put it in your bag you hid it in the bag and then you brought it to school instead of being darkness it was light that was day two of the science lesson and we were told way back then, darkness is actually not substance. It has no matter. It simply means where there be no light. So while as we cocked the darkness, when we came to school and there was light, so darkness cannot stay anymore in the bottle. Because you have brought the darkness to a place where there be what? Where there be light. When we have no access to the deep things that are locked up in God, the result is, the result is that darkness will be hovering over our lives. There are very many dark areas of our lives. It reminds me of that scientist. He was wondering what, what makes a fruit fall from the tree. He really was wondering, what makes things fall down? And many of those scientists really had their moment of contention with the darkness in them. Before they discovered what we now call the gravitational pull or law of gravity, someone had to break through that darkness so that when he gets light, we all can have light. There are certain areas of our lives where we don't have, allow me to use the word formula. We don't know how to get out of it. We know we are in it, the mess, the problem. 
the challenge, the need, the issue. But we don't know how to get out of it, Mr. Ephantas Kamau. That simply means, as far as the victory in that particular area is concerned, you are in darkness. But the Bible says we are not in darkness, brethren, because of Christ in us. But you see, if Christ is not revealed to us, while as we have he who is the light of the world within us, we might be found walking in darkness. That's why we gather here this morning, and that's why we're looking at God's word, so that we can get the light. Because once you get light, no more praying and fasting to get the darkness out. The darkness, the light will just dispel darkness. Can I hear an amen? And now, this takes us to the life of a one man called Job. I have really mentioned his name twice or thrice before today. I never quite got into it. But let's look at Job. Job is one classical example of a man who was in darkness without his knowledge. And needed a confrontation to bring him into the real called light. So as to shift him from the level he was to the next level. Now he was in a very good level. Righteous man. Walked with God, sacrificing to God, godly children. He was the richest man. That's a good level. Uh, but there's a better level. There's a better level. There's a level better than good. And so the man needed to be shifted to that level. Now, the book of Job is perhaps the oldest book in the Bible. It is set in the period of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, whether or not it was a written book, I cannot confirm. All I can tell you is that Abraham read this book, Isaac read this book, perhaps Jacob and Joseph read this book, or knew about this book, and for them it was not a focus on a book as a written text, it was focused on the life of a man whom God has given for us to learn certain things. So the book of Job tells us the story of a man who lost everything, his wealth, his family, his health, and wrestled with the question, why? As I speak here this morning, I do know many of us have that question, why? Why? I have been counseling with some of us, and I am without mentioning your names, but I know I have the liberty to use the example to help the rest of the brethren. I have heard things like this. Why am I not able to break even financially? I've had questions like this. Why am I always in debt? I have had a question. Why am I always so close to the miracle and yet so far away from the miracle? The why question. The why question. It's a question that begs to know the reason behind something. And when someone asks the why question, he is seeking for nothing less than wisdom. When you ask the why question, you are not looking for some religious explanation to anything. You are looking for the wisdom of God. And this book of Job begins with a heavenly debate between God and Satan moves through three cycles of other debates between Job and his friends and concludes with a dramatic divine diagnosis of Job's problem. God finally answered the question, why? Why did I lose my children, my wealth, my health? We read in Job 2, verse 11 to 13, that when Job's three friends heard of this adversity, the evil, the, the evil, the affliction, the mischief, the trouble, the harm he, that had come upon him, that is the loss of his property, his children, and health, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namadite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. Now when you are in trouble, you don't need fellow mourners in life. You know, what most of us do when you have a certain challenge, you look for those who are going through the same similar challenge and you come up with a fellowship of uh, like-minded, as they say, uh, people. Now, if you are in a ditch, none of you can help the others get out of the ditch. You don't need people who come and mourn with you when you're in trouble. 
But you need someone who can begin to give, put in your hands a key that unlocks that situation. So when they came, they raised their eyes from afar, did not recognize him. They lifted their voice and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days, seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. What? What mourners? They came to mourn with you, and for seven days, no one says anything? For they saw that his grief was very great. All right. Please don't allow our life to get to that place where people even feel like they cannot even say let us pray because of the kind of trouble you are in. Let's access Christ. Let's talk to God. Let's access the deep things of God. Don't allow life to get to a place where people even fear to tell you they are praying for you. And so these three friends, each of them had their own presentation to make, so to say, to him as their effort to help the man understand what he's going through. I'm not so keen about the first two men. I'm keen on the third man, and this is Zophar, the Namathite. His name Zophar means a sparrow. So Zophar comes to drop a tweet. He's about to tweet. He's about to send a very compressed word of wisdom. To his friend. Zopha. The sparrow. And uh, he comes from a place called. Nama. Let me look at it one more time. A place called. Uh, Nama. He is a Namathite for that reason. He comes from Nama. Namathite. And it means pleasantness. It's nothing as pleasant. As honey, which is symbolic of the revelation of God's word. So while as he came to mourn, he would drop a word in Job's spirit that would set him on a path in readiness for the day of facing God to get the ultimate wisdom concerning the troubles he was going through in life. Did you know that the whole purpose of our sufferings is to refine us in readiness for presentation? The whole purpose of our sufferings is to refine us in readiness for presentation. You need to be presented. To your neighbors. You need to be presented in your family. You need to be presented in your place of work. Now before the day of presentation. There is a day of refinement. There is a day of suffering. James encourages us. He says brethren counted all joy when you suffer. But that was not the attitude of Job. Neither is the attitude of none of us here. When we go through suffering, instead of understanding what is going on and cooperating with God, and so we can be refined in readiness for presentation, most of us murmur and complain. Look at it in James 1 verse 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, various fires in this life. The fires, the floods, the den of lions, the fires, the floods, the den of lions that we go through fine tune our spiritual sight. The fires we go through, just like gold is purified, silver is purified through fire, similarly the fires you go through purify or fine tune your spiritual sight and shift you from temporal mindedness to eternal or eternity mindedness. Now, that's what Job had not known. And that's what most of us need to know. Did you know that until you know the purpose for your suffering, you may end up prolonging that suffering? Daniel? Daniel? If you don't know why you are in the den of lions, you might stay there a bit longer. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you don't know why you are in the fire, you might be in that fire a bit longer. But when you look at those three Hebrew boys, they knew why they are going to be in the fire even before they got into the fire. They already knew that God was going to redeem them to show himself strong and mighty on their behalf when they get to the fire. But then they said, just in case God is not willing to deliver us, as we do know he's going to, be it known to you, O king, we will not bow. So what was the purpose of the fire? You have to go back and find out why were they implicated? Why were they thrown into the fire? It was all about who will you worship? So they were so clear, they had an, they had an eternity mindedness, they had a focus on God, and so when they got into trouble for that reason, for that purpose, they understood and they allowed God, they allowed the trials to have their full work and effect on their lives. For the glory of God. Now, let's go back to Job. Job 11. Only three verses, verse 7 to 9. Then Zophar, the Namadite, answered and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? So whose words are these? These are Job's many words. Murmuring, complaining, cursing, whining. Shouldn't they be answered? And should a man full of talk be vindicated? If you have presented your case, why should you also not be answered? Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? For you have said, my doctrine is pure. pure. It's called self-righteousness. It's called self-righteousness. The way some of us argue our cases. We say, Mr. Boss, I have done everything right. Mr. Boss, is there one thing you can accuse me of? Mr. Boss, is there any one area in which I have failed to perform? And of course they say no. So why are you, we like to use the word, victimizing me? And why are you taking advantage of me? All of that is very good talk. It's very good talk. But it is called self-righteousness. Could it be that it is God who allowed Job to go through the loss? In fact, let me remove the word could because we now do know. Is it not the Lord who allowed? So is God wicked? Is God unrighteous? Does God tempt a man with evil? So why, why then would God allow? Why would God allow? A righteous man to go through the troubles that he went through. We are also asking the, quest, the why question. Just like Job was asking. So the why question is no longer about why is Job suffering. The why question should be why did God allow this? There's a likelihood that some of us are going through some very painful moments even now. I found that as you mature in Christ, the fires increase. When we started out in Christianity, there were, had, there were hardly any fires. There were hardly any strongholds we faced. But as you grow in him, and as you mature, and as Christ is getting revealed to and in and through you, Discover the intensity of the fire. It's no longer one times hot. Gets two times, three times. Nabado. One day to be seven times hotter. Those are the moments you are not even sure you are born again. Though you are. Because salvation is not circumstantial. It's not a feeling. Those are moments you are not sure whether God is with you. Though he is. He said I will never leave you nor forsake you. Those are moments you are not walking anymore by feelings. You have to walk by faith. Those are moments where your breakthrough and victory is in your faith. Not in your circumstantial experience of life itself. So why would God allow? Why did God allow this on a righteous man? Or the man said, my doctrine is pure and I'm clean in your eyes. 
But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you. That he would show you the secrets of wisdom. For they would double your prudence. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. <laughs> I, I thought the man came to mourn with him. This is not too good. It's not too good. He's telling him, if God dealt with you according to your sin, it will be worse than this. I, I don't know how you like so, those kind of mourners. But I don't mind if that is going to put in my hands the key to unlock and begin to understand. To change the story from chapter, from chapter 11 so we can have the hope of, of hope of chapter 42 and others. That will be a bit different. The day when God will say, stand up as a man and let's talk. Let me give you an understanding. Friends, I want to present to you this morning. That the purpose of most of the sufferings you have gone through this far. Was supposed to make your life better. But most of us lost the chance. And most of us lost, wasted the opportunity. Instead of becoming, becoming better, we became bitter. Instead of becoming wiser, we became foolish. So verse 7 is the key verse here now. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the almighty? That verse 7 in the message version says, Do you think you can explain the mystery of God? Do you think you can diagram God Almighty? Yani unafikineza kuchora mungu kama katuni. New International Version, say, Version says, Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? New Living Translation. New Living Translation. Can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Hmm. Amplified. Can you discover the depths of God? Can you, by searching, discover the limits of the Almighty? That is to ascend to his heights and extend to his width and comprehend his in infinite perfection? Can you, in your own self, can you, by yourself, Can you, Mr. Job, did you know that the literal you know about him was given to you by revelation? And you cannot go beyond there unless he chooses to open another vault, another portal of information for you. See, Job's suffering had to do with the darkness in his life. Most of the pain we go through life is supposed to serve the purpose of reminding you, or at least indicating to you, there's some darkness that needs to be dispelled from your life. The absence of light. The absence of light. And for those of you who like, who go, who like to go ahead of the teacher, please go home and read from chapter 12 to the end of the book of Job and see what darkness was existing in his life. One of which is, he had not known the way that is not known by the wise. Even the lion, the lion does not know that way. Even the kings of this world don't know that way. And that way is called wisdom. So, after he, so he is suffering. After all, he is suffering for something better. And we do know, yes, that is true because at the end of the day, when he was restored, he got everything double. And I know we, we really like that double part of it. We even seeing it. But are you ready to go through the path men and women go through before they can get everything a double, double, low? A double, double, low. There's a refining. The purpose of this refining was to point Job to the fact that there were certain things about God he did not know. Could it be there are certain things about God that you and I do not know? 
Could it be that Paul the great apostle, after planning all the churches and all the missionary trips, still did not know something about God? Might that be the reason why in Philippians 3 he says, I count everything else as loss for this one thing. I want to exactly know him. Can a great apostle be in a place where he has darkness in some certain way, areas of his life, because he has not known, he has not known all of Christ? Let's proceed and read another portion of scriptures because time seems to be run away from, running away from me today for some reason. I'm in 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. Writings of Paul from verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the age for our glory. This hidden wisdom the hidden things, things that are hidden up in God, locked up in God, the deep things of God, they are hidden for our glory. When you access it, it becomes like a garment on you. It makes you visible. It makes you noticeable. When you access this wisdom, then you are sent in glory. The absence of this wisdom in any man's life, relegates him, leaves him or her in a place of darkness, and they are helpless until the day God will tell them, Stand up as a man, let's talk. And God will show you this way and set your feet on that path of wisdom, locked up in God. <clears throat> Hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. If you are reading your own Bible, please underline that part B of verse 7. Hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory. It is as you access that wisdom that you ascend in glory. As you access that wisdom, you increase in glory. As you access that wisdom, you are no longer naked having to put on fig leaves on your back. You find a new garment called the glory of God. Then verse 8 says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. Watch that. None of the rulers of this age knew. I mean, we've been celebrating them whether living or dead, about how wise they were and how great they were, their great achievements. Could it be that some of them, yes, were great, but had not accessed this wisdom that is made available to you and me because we are sons of God. If the rulers of this age could be rulers, curious, great people, without this wisdom, what manner of men must we be? If someone could become great without this wisdom, what about you and I who has access to the wisdom that God ordained before for our glory? One of the Bible says, I has not seen. Ear has not heard. You even have no idea. You yourself, you have no idea of what you're going to become in Christ. 
in days that are coming. Say aloud, amen. amen. Many of us have no clue. We are clueless about what we are becoming in Christ. The rulers of this age did not know it. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things. Everyone say the things. Everyone say the things. The things which God has prepared, not will prepare, has prepared for those who love him. In days that are coming, we'll study this little phrase here, those who love him, because I want you to understand that the deep things of God, the secrets of God, are only given to those who love him. As we do this series of teaching, love for God will take a completely new, new uh, direction and we'll get a new definition of the same. Then verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things, the bathos, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually designed. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightfully judged by no one, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. The deep things of God cannot be known in any other way other than through the revelation that the Holy Spirit gives us. The Spirit knows the deep things of God. The primary reason why he was given to us, the Holy Spirit, it was more than just speaking in tongues and healing the sick. It was more than the charismatic side of it. The gifts of power. Men rolling on the carpet. That's the, that's the charismatic. The Holy Ghost is not only charismatic. The gift side of him is not only on that side of gift charismatic. But there is a charis side of him. So there is something more than just gifts operating through the Holy Ghost. There is the charis side which is the dispensation the dispensing, rather, of grace. So from the same Holy Ghost, we receive the gifts and the power thereof, but from the same Holy Spirit, we receive the grace and the nature and character thereof. And so there is a work he does in you, and also there is a work he does through you. When you operate gifts, it means the Holy Ghost is doing a work through you. Because when you heal people, it's not you being healed, it's others being healed. So it's a work being done through you to others. But there's a work he does in you. And that work is to reveal Christ to you, reveal Christ in you, reveal Christ through you. So he is given to us, and there are several words used in the Bible to describe him. One of them is comforter. There's another one, and I think I kind of like this one more. The other one is teacher. He's our teacher. So he is given to teach us. No one accesses the deep things of God, according to verse 13, without attending the school of the Spirit. Now, I'm not referring to the school being offered by Almon Institute. By the way, I have discovered very few of us have registered for that school. Uh, please, we are about to close the doors. We'll close the doors on Friday. And there's nothing wrong with uh, our members here being part of that school. But you have to be ready for discipline. I'm not referring to the Almond Institute School of, School of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm referring to the daily, constant, continuous learning and teaching of the Holy Spirit in your own personal life. No believer can progress in their knowledge of God if they are not sitting down to be taught by the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. He's your teacher. In his day, Jesus Christ in the earth, he was the Rabboni, the teacher. In his absence, the Holy Spirit is our Rabboni, he's our teacher. Now under 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, 1 John, put it up on the screen, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, before we go to verse 27, says, But you have an, an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from the Holy One abided you and you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. The all things here are the deep things. As the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, the deep things of God is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Powerful. The Holy Spirit and he alone will teach you, reveal to you the deep things. The deep things of God are revealed to those of us who love God and who reveals them. It's the Holy Spirit how and when as he teaches us. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Spirit teaches Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now watch this. The deep things of God are all spiritual. But seeks a physical, visible manifestation. Christ has to be revealed in you before he can be revealed through you in a visible way. Whether it will be an epiphany, if God chooses to give people an open vision or give you an open vision, whichever way. But at least he has to be revealed to, these things must be revealed to you as you are taught by the Holy Spirit. You cannot be deep in God if you ignore the teacher, the Holy Spirit. And I think this message comes at the right time when the world over now, man is turning more towards the nows, the mind, the soul. Other than listening to the spirit within. You know God has put depth in man. That spirit. And that depth in man cries for the depth in God. The depth in God is spirit. The depth in man is spirit. And so when the deep in us cries for the deep in God. God will activate his own spirit within us. To teach and reveal to us these things that are locked up in him. Say amen. amen. You see the purpose of creation is to manifest the various attributes of God. And we are part of creation. We are. Except we are superior creation. In fact, if you be born again, the Bible already says you are a unique or a new creation. We are not of the order of the first man. We are the order of the last man. So we are not just creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. So why this new creation? Why did God through Christ create you, create me and you? Then you have to go back to Ephesians 2 and verse 10. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. The scripture says we are his workmanship. We are his creation. Created in Christ Jesus. For good works which God prepared. Now the good works God prepared is the way God chooses to manifest the deep things in God through us as we take formation in Christ and as we get created in Christ. That's the manifestation of the sons of God. The Romans 8 and verse 19 talks about. Now last Sunday as we were going home, my daughter told me, not last Sunday, on Wednesday after preaching, my, <laughs> my daughter told me, hey dad, uh, you lost me somewhere. 
siku si kushika vizuri hebu nieleze ulisikuwa unahubiri aje so i hope i'm not losing any of us this morning she didn't make me think that these deep things are too deep other mimi zielewi na sieleweshi watu na watu hawalewi nika it disturb me but i hope you understand what we say god is at work in us to create us a new creation so that we can be positioned to become the instrument to make the invisible god invisible through the things god will work through us in the earth and that includes everything including who you get married to god will reveal himself even through who you get married to i'm just using that as an example there are many more things i could use let me talk about business god will make himself visible to this world through you through the kind of business you do mr borogoto Hey, are you still there, Mr. Borogoto? There are works, Ephesians 2 verse 10, that God prepared for us, new creation, so as we swing into action, our strategic action becomes a revealer, becomes a trailer. Is that a good place to use the word trailer? Becomes a trailer of what is about to show up on earth. So as for me, Isaiah says, as for me and my sons, we are for signs and wonders. Meaning, whenever anyone sets their eyes on you, they should get a glimpse of the future. And it's not about choosing what you think is better. Even preaching. God can use you as a preacher to reveal the future to people. He can use a teacher. He can use nursing. He can use architecture. He can use uh, music. He could use anything. As long as it's the inner work of God in you, then you become the tool of, to be used by God to make the future known. So as for me and my sons, we are for what? Isaiah chapter what? And verse what? Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. As for me and my sons, we are for signs and wonders in the earth. So when God is revealed to you, when the deep things of God become your inheritance, you begin to live in the future, but in the present. You become an icon, an indicator of the things that are up yet to unfold in a physical sense in the earth below. That's what I want. I want that. Because the purpose of the entire of creation is to manifest the various attributes of God. And there are so many attributes of God. One of them is that God is great. And God wants to use you, Mr. Borogoto, to show the world how great our God is. This thing has, must go beyond a song. We can sing how great is our God. Sing with me. You are not singing. And all we see Now listen to me, Mr. King Ori. That greatness of God should be seen through your physiotherapy adventures. Come on, Mr. Elijah in Kijabe Hospital. The greatness of God should be seen through you. We were having a talk with my daughter. She is uh, studying and, of course, in a hospital somewhere. And she tells me, hey, Dad, Hey, the other day, Mukubwa alikuja. And I began to say, I may never touch or come near the Wakubwa, but my own daughter will be injecting them. Sintano. Yeah. So I began to say, then I should train this young girl in such a manner when finally she is injecting the Mukubwa, the Mukubwa sees angels ascending and descending. Because they are nurses and they are what? They are nurses. God will use your career to cause somebody somewhere to go home saying, I think that is a doctor with a difference. Please give me your number. Please give me your number. Oh, praise God. I said praise God. Let's read one more, one more. Do 
Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. It's very easy to remember that. 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. That we may do all the words of this law. Part of the heritage that you should give to your children and part of the legacy what they should remember you for is that there was something that was locked up in God for generations but in your day it was revealed to you and you disseminated it to others. Each of us must know God and access hidden things in God. It will be said there's one man who preached something that opened my eyes. I had never seen it. I had never known it. There's one person who visited me. I was in the hospital and prayed for me. And that prayer opened something for me. He did not only pray that God heals me. He prayed, oh God, give him divine health. And I never fell sick another day. For a man to make such a kind of a prayer, they must have seen something beyond praying for you to be healed. So everything that is not revealed is still locked up in God. But watch this. We already saw it in 1 Corinthians that God prepared it. You know, God is not selfish. God, I mean, God does not become poor by giving you. You know, God is not, is not depleted. You cannot exhaust God. God is inexhaustible. Within, within him is an unsearchable riches. So, so God is not struggling with if I give this revelation to them, I will remain with nothing. Not at all. What he is looking for is to see a generation postured in the earth in readiness to become the express image of God who therefore hunger for these things locked up in God. Say amen. amen. I said say amen. amen. God may be unknown to you, but that's, that does not make God unknowable. God is knowable, although he is not known by all. One of the things we are getting rid of as a family is darkness. There will be no more darkness in this house. Amen. We shall walk in the light. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Economically, we shall walk in the light. Amen. Our family shall walk in the light. Amen. Our health will be in the light. Amen. Our education in the light. Amen. Our church in the light. Amen. Our businesses in the light. Amen. Everything will be in the light. Amen. How will that be? When the secret things that are hidden in God becomes our inheritance. When they are revealed to us, they are no longer hidden things that belong to God. They become things known to us. They become part of the legacy we will leave someday, sometime. Say amen. amen. Some of us will write some books and those books will remain for generations opening people's eyes. Some of us will write just one song and that song will open up whole churches, whole services. This morning they sang one of the songs and I think the song had a key. It just opened something in the spirit. For us as a church. Whoever sang that song, I can guarantee you, they had seen something in God. Because you're too new, but we're too. Musani, two studio, studio, too. You know, songs show you the level of revelation the singer had. Some saw the devils, they sang about the devil. So if you see the devil, you're going to see the devil. For example, so the time needs to be running away from me. Let me conclude with Matthew 13. Matthew 13 verse 44 is a good place to close as we hope to meet again on Wednesday. Continue. Matthew 13 verse 44. Again, you know, this is a chapter with many parables about the kingdom of God. So after giving a parable, he says, again, another one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. The treasure is hidden in a field and a man finds it and hides it and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field I think Paul had read this verse before writing Ephesians 3 verse 8 
that all that was precious to me, I count as nothing. In other words, I can do what is called trade in. Trade in. He goes and sells all that was precious. He found something more precious. When I was a young man, I wish I knew as much as I know today. I'm about to resign from Stanchat through my mother, my mother-in-law. I had an opportunity of buying plots in a land buying scheme. It's called Goigua. As you're entering Fika town on your left, all of that was a coffee farm. And because of my mother's favor, she was an official. They said all the children to the officials can buy a share. And a share was a 50 by 80, not 50 by 100. That is an eighth of an acre. And we could buy a share for 15,000 shillings. Now, because I was only young, I did not really understand the value of these things. I was on fire for the gospel. And I was going to heaven by speedy post. I didn't care about these other things. I was saying bye-bye to the whole world. But my mother, through my sister-in-law, prevailed on me. They said, Nganga, Tigawana. That is to say, don't be kubafu. So, you know, you know, when your in-laws talk to you, uh, you want to be in good books with them. So I had to cooperate. And I looked for some money and bought four plots, eighths, each at 15,000. And I bought them murmuring and complaining, <laughs> like Job. <laughs> Saying, why? Don't you know I'm a full-timer? Now today I look back and say, I wish they pushed me further to buy 20 of them. I would just have had to sell my car only. But you know what? Unless your eyes are open to know what is treasurable, you remain poor. You know, us in the kingdom of God, we are sitting on the richest treasure available on earth. We are the most blessed people. We are on the most expensive, most precious corner of the earth. But until your eyes are open to know that the kingdom is a treasure, you don't transact in the kingdom. But this man, on knowing that this field was carrying or containing a treasure, after finding it, for joy, for joy, for joy, for joy, went out, sold all he had, and bought that field. What was costing 15,000 shillings way back then, should have been 1998, today goes for, uh, I think, 4 million. That is Ukipata. Be a broker. Kama utapa, maana hakuko, hasiko, lakini ukipa, na sasa yonina haina broker. I think it's 5,000, 5 million. Ukipata, that is Ukipata. I pray that God will open our eyes and give us a desire for these things that are locked up in God because they will answer every question in your life. Economic, health, social, every question in your, of your life will be answered when you lay hold on this treasure. That is locked up in God. Thank God with me for his word if you can. Maybe standing up with your hand lifted. Because of time. Quickly please because of time. Thank you Father. Thank you Lord. The hope of our calling is the revealing of Christ from within us. That's what we desire Father. Christ be revealed from within us. Christ be revealed from within us. And the purpose of the work you're doing in us as a church this time round is to make your various attributes visible. May we know the greatness. May we know the power. May we know the faithfulness. Found and get church, raise your voice and thank God for his word. This word changes your life. Thank him by faith. We don't worship him by feelings. We thank him by faith. Thank him for a new world. A new earth and a new heaven that is about to unfold. 
We now know the purpose of our sufferings, Father. It is so, so that we can it is so that we can know that you are in business with us and you are preparing us for presentation. You have determined to glorify yourself using us. You are bringing us to a place of entire love for you. Loving you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, with all our mind, with our all, everything. Thank you, Jesus. Take two more minutes at the top of your voice with your hands lifted up and thank God. Let me tell you something, it's about to get better. The fiery trials you have gone through, the pains you have gone through in life only prepared you for a better day. This is that day of seeking Him and finding Him. This is that day of knowing Him by revelation. This is that day of walking in great power. This is that day of walking in the revelation of Christ. This is that day of being taught by the Spirit. This is that day when the deep things that are lying in God will be revealed to us. This is that day when the deep things become our inheritance. All those things locked up in God are being revealed to us. So we raise our voices, everybody. So we worship the Lord at the top of our voice, thanking Him. Thank Him, thank Him, thank Him. Oh yes, everything the heavens is holding is ours. We are rising up, we are raiding the heavens. We are raiding the heavens, everything locked up there, everything unknown in the earth will be known in our generation. Everything unknown in the earth will be known, everything locked up in God will be revealed. Open my eyes, oh God, open our eyes, oh God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We want to see you, Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, oh God. Open the eyes of my heart, oh God. We want to see you. We want to see you, Lord. See you high and lifted up. Keep praying everyone. Tell him Lord open my eye, the eyes of my heart oh God. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart Lord. Open the eyes of my heart Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Make it your prayer. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, Lord. want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. To see you high and lifted up. So it looks like that's this is the song of the season. So we'll sing the song together. But we'll sing it a bit faster, all right? Sing it a bit faster. Give us the drum a bit faster. All right, play like this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Give us the kick, yes. Give us the kick. Everybody sing with me. Open the eyes, oh God. Clap your hands, everyone. Open them, I pray, Lord. I want to see you. 
I wanna see you. Open the eyes of my heart. Make it your prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I wanna see. You. Make it faster. Make it faster. I wanna see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open them, I pray, Jesus. I wanna see you. I wanna see you. To see you. Shining in the light. Shining in the light of your glory. For out to power and love. As we sing holy, holy. See you. Make it your prayer this morning. For out your power and love as we sing holy, holy to see you shining in the light of your glory. For out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, seizing holy, holy, holy as we sing. As we sing, clap your hands like mine. As we sing, holy, holy, as we sing, holy, 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 I wanna see you. I wanna see you, Lord. Raise your hand and make it your prayer. I wanna see you, oh God. Raise your voice and say, Lord, I wanna see you. We come against spiritual blindness in this house in the name of Jesus. We release the spirit of revelation, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding in the knowledge of God. Every blind eye will be open in this house. Men will see the Lord. Men will know the Lord. Men will walk with the Lord. Men will have a revelation. We will be taught of God in his ways. We'll be taught of the Lord in his ways. He will teach us. Come on, everyone, raise your cry like a deer that pants for the waters. Come on, everyone, raise your cry as a deer that pants for the waters. Pour on us, oh God, pour on me, oh God, pour on me. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your love and power. We sing holy, holy, holy. I wanna see. That's our cry, oh Father, is a house. That's our cry, oh God. Oh God, release on us the spirit of revelation one more time. Release on us the spirit of understanding one more time as a house. Release on us hunger and thirst for God one more time, oh God. May you change us, may you renew us, may you restore us, may you raise us up, oh God. May you resurrect us, oh God. May you strengthen us one more time, oh God, we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Quite a number of us are feeling distant from the Lord. Quite a number of us feel like we lost it, that close walk with him, that touch with him, that voice of the spirit, that intimacy with God. But God is restoring it to us. Raise your hand and say, Lord, I receive, I receive a new anointing. And this anointing will teach me the ways of God. This anointing will guide me in the ways of God. I will need no man to teach me for you will teach me by your spirit, oh God. I cry out for more of you. I cry out. I cry out as the deer that pants for the waters. I cry out. 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 Some of us want to do it spontaneously. Feel free. We still have a minute or two. Just go ahead. Shall 
Raise your own personal cry now if you can. It's a moment for all those who are hungry and thirsty for God. Feel free, feel free. There's a wind blowing in this house from the west to the east. Normally it is from the east to the west, but this morning there's a wind blowing from the west to the east. Kasharia <laughs> 